All right, folks, this is Becky with Ace Helper Shelby, who's got lots of experience with this. And Shelby's helping me to see if we've got the video going. So if anybody's online and can hear me this time, okay. let Helper me know. Shelby. I can hear you. All right. Okay. It seems well, like we're working. So we're going to keep trying this again, see how it goes. I know that there were uh, lots of questions before. I see a hello, which sounds promising. Maybe that means um, you can hear me. So it is Becky with New Hampshire Audubon and answering your questions about birds and other natural history topics. Uh, so um, appreciate any comments letting me know that you can see me and that you can hear me. Oh, somebody's saying great to hear me, listening from Panacook. Um, all right, let me know if things go okay or if they go sideways, let me know that too. Nothing like a little bit of experience to help get the kinks out of the works. So while we're, um, while we're getting started here and I'm making sure everything's working, um, I'll uh, give you a little update on spring migration. There are a lot of birds coming back right now. Um, people are starting to see Orioles. They like to come into oranges and to uh, sometimes uh, sugar water or jelly that you can put out. And um, we may be starting to see our first indigo buntings, which are all blue birds. Uh, sometimes they'll come into feeders, but usually only in the spring, right when they first come back. Uh, Rose-breasted grosbeaks are starting to come. They've got that, um, that bright reddish um, rosy patch on the breast, um, and the males do anyway, you know, beautiful singers. Okay, it looks like maybe things are working. I'm seeing a couple of comments that uh, sounds like you can hear me, so that's a really good thing. Um, and for migration, we've also got a lot of warblers starting to come back. Uh, the, the early ones are back, the yellow rumped warblers, the yellow warblers, the pine warblers. They've been back for a little while, but now we're getting our later migrants coming in. And uh, they're really colorful birds, wonderful to see. And uh, they're headed farther north to nest. So, you know, there's a lot of snow up there right now. So they'll be um, delayed maybe a little while before they get up there. Uh, and before their habitat has any food for them because they're insect eaters. So let's see, what else have we got coming for spring migration? House wrens are starting to come back and the first bobolinks in the fields have been reported. Uh, some of you may have sparrows coming if you're scattering seed out on the ground. I can't put my feeders up now because of bears, but I scatter mixed seed on the ground and I've got a lot of white-throated sparrows and a couple of white-crowned sparrows. The white-throateds are very common, but the white crowns we only see during migration. So once again, it's Becky from New Hampshire Audubon. Uh, welcome, and I'm very glad if you can see me and you can hear me. So as we're getting going, I want to talk about uh, a couple of commonly asked questions at this time of the year. And one of them is when to put up hummingbird feeders. And yes, it is time to put up your hummingbird feeders. We're getting the first few reports, particularly in the southern part of the state. I saw a male on my back deck just the other day. He came to my feeder, sipped a little, and then I think he moved on. Haven't seen him again. But go ahead and put your hummingbird feeders up now. Uh, those of you in the northern part of the state, it might be a little bit optimistic um, to think about having hummingbirds just yet, especially if you've still got snow on the ground, but it won't be long. Uh, so I'd go ahead, put them up. Uh, when it comes to hummingbird feeders, go ahead and um, put your nectar in. Uh, the nectar can be anywhere from one part, um, uh, I'm sorry, one part sugar to four to eight parts water. And you want to bring it to a boil. You don't need to do more than just bring it to a boil and then um, keep it refrigerated and put it out in small amounts so it doesn't go bad. You don't need to put the red dye in. Uh, if the feeder has some red on it, then um, 
the hummingbirds will be attracted because they come to anything that is red and they check it out. So how are we doing out here, folks? Can everybody hear me? I got a hello from Maine and from Penacook, so that sounds like the sound is working. But if somebody can send me a quick comment that says, yep, we're hearing you, that would be just great. Uh, all right, so hummingbirds just coming back. Time to put feeders up and out for them. Now, another thing that we've got going on right now that starts up just about this time, or maybe a little bit even earlier, is you'll notice that you've got maybe a cardinal flying and pecking at your window, and it won't stop. Oh, thank you, Susan. I'm glad you can hear and see me. I appreciate that. Okay. So you've got a bird flying and pecking at your window. And what the heck do you do about it? And why is it doing it? Well, I had one person call in one time that had a robin flying and pecking at his window and he wondered if it was his mother-in-law that had come back to haunt him. And I can safely reassure him and everybody else that it is not your mother-in-law coming back to haunt you. Um, the bird is seeing its reflection in the outside surface of the window. So it sees its reflection and it thinks that there's a rival bird in its territory. And so it's trying to drive the rival bird away. Birds are territorial when they're nesting. They have that territory of theirs where they nest, where they find food, and where their mate is. So they want to defend that territory from any other interlopers. So the bird sees its reflection, it sees an interloper in its territory and says, I'm going to drive that bird out. So it flies at it and flies at it and flies at it to try and drive the bird away. And of course it doesn't work because it's a reflection. So the thing that works the best is to put something on the outside surface of the window. The bird's not trying to get into your house. It doesn't matter what you do on the inside of the window. What you want to do is put something on the outside surface of the window so that the um, reflection that is bothering this bird will be gone. Now, you may need to do it just for a few days so it gets out of the habit of coming. Uh, or it, you may need to do it for longer. There seem to be some birds that are easily discouraged and others that keep coming back over and over again. Now, what could you put on the outside surface of your window? Well, you can temporarily tape up some newspaper or a piece of cardboard. If you've got a screen, put that up. Um, or there's that fake snow stuff, the glass wax that you can spray on the outside of the window and that should work to dull the reflection. The other thing that you may need to do is if there's a particular perch that this bird really likes, you may need to block the perch so it can't land on it. So if there's a perch right near the window and that's where it sees its reflection from, then go ahead and block that perch off, even for a little while, put a sheet over it, something that, that means it can't land there anymore. So sometimes you have to get a little bit creative, but keep in mind the bird will not try to get in your house. That's not why it's there. It's not out of its mind. It's a perfectly normal bird. It is wasting energy, but it is unlikely to hurt itself. Um, you know, it's spending a lot of time, a lot of energy just trying to, to, um, to drive away the rival and the rival's not going away. That energy could probably be better spent. So it is helpful if you can try and discourage the bird from doing that, um, but it is a, it's a natural behavior. So if you've got any questions out there for me, please go ahead and, um, and do a comment and we'll keep talking about what's happening this spring um, and what's going on with birds and with our um, natural natural world. So again, it's Becky at New Hampshire Audubon. Thanks for joining me. So another thing that's starting to happen is uh, the turtles are starting to come out. I'm sure you've seen them sunning. 
and our most common turtle is a painted turtle and they're oftentimes out on logs in ponds to, to get warm and it won't be long before they're starting to nest and that's when they can get onto roads as they cross roads looking for sandy soil to nest in and um, sometimes as we're driving along we see turtles and it really is helpful to help them cross the road so they don't get run over. Obviously you need to do it safely but if you do find a turtle in the middle of the road and you want to help it out, pull over safely, go back and move the turtle forward in the direction that it was going even if that's farther from the side of the road because it's headed in a particular direction. It knows where there's a nesting area it wants to go to. So go ahead and, and move it. Uh, and thank you. I'm sorry, I'm taking a quick look at the comments. It's hard to talk and um, look at the comments at the same time. So I see a lot of hellos. So it's sounding like, yes, you can see me. Um, we've got a suggestion on uh, if you've got a bird pecking and flying at the window, that window cling works well. It's easy to use and to take down. That's a great idea. Again, you want to block that reflection in the outside surface of the window. And all right, then we've got a hello from Arizona. Well, Arizona is hummingbird country. So um, you've got a lot of hummingbirds coming in there. All right, thank you. Uh, so um, just a reminder on those turtles, move them in the direction that they're going and uh, then they'll, they'll dig a nest and put some eggs uh, in it and then they will head back to the water. So they could be on their way to nesting or on the way back to the water. So thanks for helping them out. Uh, going back around to those Baltimore Orioles that have just come back. And I just saw one at New Hampshire Audubon's parking lot this morning. Orioles will come to those orange halves that you can put out. And we've got a question on how long to keep out this feeder. You'll have to determine that by what is going on with the birds. So sometimes Orioles will come to the oranges right away when they first get back and then they stop and they're not coming and you can see the oranges kind of start to go bad. So at that point, you might as well say, okay, Oriole feeding is done. Some people will have Orioles that come all summer long and you'll see them coming and you'll see them coming to the oranges and you can keep putting those oranges out if, that's, if, if they're coming. Now I know last year we had some cool weather right after the Orioles came back and they came into the oranges for quite a while, for three to four weeks. Some people were getting six, eight, and 10 Orioles coming to feeders. Hard to know whether we're gonna have that this year or not. We've certainly had some crazy cold weather and windy weather, um, but keep those um, oranges out for as long as you've got birds coming to them. And jelly is another thing that, that Orioles will come to. Grape jelly, is one of the ones that is sort of informally thought of as to be a good good jelly, but you could try just about any kind and see which ones they like. Um, I tend to try and use organic jelly if I can, um, so that just like for me, the birds are, are getting a more natural product. Um, but many of the Oriole feeders these days will have spikes to like this to put your orange on top of. There's your, ooh, there's your spike. Hey, the camera is backwards. All right, there's the spike. Here's the orange on top of it. Uh, and then they'll have little cups for jelly as a part of the feeder. It's a great combo feeder to have. So go ahead and, um, and um, put that out. Question about whether the sugar content is too high in grape jelly. I think we have any real research on that to know uh, whether whether that's high. Grapes are already fairly sweet as it is. 
um, but I've not seen any research on whether grape jelly is too sweet. Uh, that might be a tough one to determine. But Orioles will also go for the sugar water nectar that we feed to hummingbirds, and that's got a pretty high content of sugar as well. Um, but I don't think I can give you a definitive answer on that. For if, you're, if it's something that you're concerned about, I'd go ahead and put out real grapes for them. Um, they might, well, you might have to experiment as to whether you need to cut them in half, um, but, but they, um, they provide that natural grape sugar. All right, so I mentioned the indigo buntings that sometimes come into feeders and the rose-breasted grosbeaks that will start coming into feeders um, with seed. If you're going to um, put your feeders out, you're obviously going to have to take care that you're not attracting bears. We can't talk about bird feeding without talking about bears because bird feeding can cause some problem bears and we wanna make sure we don't do that. So if you're gonna put feeders out, make sure that you don't have bears coming. If you do have bears coming again, scattering some seed on the ground is probably your best uh, option for that. If you put out suet during the summer, it can easily go rancid. So recommend that you only put out a very small supply, maybe just a one day supply, so that you're refreshing it every day and it doesn't get too oily, it doesn't go rancid. Woodpeckers will still come in and eat it and they'll be happy to have it. Uh, but again, you need to take considerations for keeping your feeders clean. All right, thanks for those questions, keep them coming. Um, I mentioned turtles happening now. The other thing that's going to be happening quite soon are baby birds. And what do we do about baby birds? So a few things to know about, about baby birds. Um, for something like a robin, when they lay eggs, it may only be 10 to 12 days before those eggs hatch. And then the young ones grow very quickly but they often leave the nest before they can fly. That's true for a lot of young baby songbirds, like robins and sparrows and things like that. Um, so they may take flight, so to speak, and find themselves hopping around on the ground. That's perfectly fine. They make a noise, a screechy noise. It can be really loud and constant so that the parents can find them and continue to feed them. So there the baby birds going, squeak, 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 feed me, feed me. And the adults come in, they feed them, they'll be in the area. So if there's a predator around, they'll try and drive them off. Um, so it's, it, again, it happens naturally. And the best thing you can do if you find a baby bird like that, which has got feathers and, um, and can hop, it's fairly independent, is just sort of shepherd it to a protected area. Now, sometimes there are cats around, and one of the things you can do is take something like a cardboard box, um, a, a, one that's not too deep, cut the front out so that it, that it makes a flat area, put the baby bird in the cardboard box, and put it in a bush. Now, there's the old wives' tale out there that says if you handle a bird, your scent will get on it and the adults won't come back. That's actually not true. Uh, most birds have a very poor sense of smell. So you can handle the bird, you handle it gently, sort of get it into the box, put the box up. Uh, if you can put the birds back in the nest, that's great. But oftentimes when a bird has hopped out of the nest, it's because it doesn't want to be in the nest anymore. So you may find you put it back and it hops right back out again. That's okay. So just um, let the adults continue to care for those young birds. Humans really don't make very good bird parents. Uh, so we wanna try and let the birds do their job as best as we can. Now, someone's mentioning that they've got bluebirds with uh, week old babies and that's great. Bluebirds nest uh, in boxes. So they uh, like to be in, in a big open habitat like fields, um, pretty big yard area would need to, you'd need to have in order to attract bluebirds. 
And then there are various plans for bluebird houses that you can put up. Um, Kim mentions that the tree swallows will harass bluebirds and they will. One of the things that you can do if you've got bluebirds and tree swallows fighting over a box is to put up another box quite close by. So bluebirds will defend a box from another pair of bluebirds, a, a nearby box from another pair of bluebirds. And tree swallows will defend a nearby box from another pair of tree swallows. But the two different species may be able to cohabitate. So you, what they tend to recommend is put a second nest box up about 10 feet from the bluebird box or the tree swallow box. So basically you've got a, a couple of boxes 10 feet apart. If that doesn't work, move them closer. Sometimes people put up boxes back to back. Bluebird uses one, a tree swallow uses another. So the tree swallows will probably be harassing this bluebird pair until they get their own nest box. And the bluebirds will continue to defend their nest box. In fact, bluebirds are pretty good at defending um, their, their nest boxes. They'll even defend from house sparrows, which can be a real problem when you have nesting bluebirds and nesting uh, tree swallows. Um, but the bluebirds will be pretty good at keeping tree swallows away. But if you've got both of them fighting over one box, put up another box, it'd be great. You, you should be able to have both species there. And, um, and Kim mentions she has two to four tree swallows that are harassing the bluebird box. So it sounds like you might want to put up several different houses um, and try one close to the bluebird box and then maybe another couple farther away uh, and see if you've got um, another pair of tree swallows that come in. Clearly, there's a, there's a shortage of uh, nesting sites in the area. So good luck with that. Now, how to deter, we've got a question. Are there any ways to deter neighborhood cats during fledge season? That can be a, a tough challenge. New Hampshire Audubon really does recommend that people keep their cats indoors for just that reason. Birds prey on a lot, um, I'm sorry, cats prey on a lot of different birds and animals and be really helpful to have indoor cats. When they're outdoors, even well-fed cats have a predatory instinct and they will continue to kill birds and animals. And young fledgling birds are very vulnerable. So probably um, trying to get the word out about the benefits of keeping cats indoors uh, is, would be really helpful. Uh, there's some great information online about cats and, and birds. And uh, you can just Google cats and birds and it'll come up. The um, American Birding Association has a great handout on it. So that might be something to, to um, give to the, the neighbors. Uh, and generally scaring the cats away when you see them will help somewhat but it, it really is hard to keep cats from predating young songbirds. Hmm. Trying to think if there are any other ideas that might help with that, uh, the scare tactics and um, letting neighbors know it's good to keep cats indoors. And then that if you see a fledgling, try putting it up in a box, up in a, in a um, a bush to get it out of, or at least just off the ground. So thanks for that question. Uh, during nesting season, um, if you have the privilege of watching a nest, there are some very interesting things that you can see. Um, but one thing that you may notice that we got a question about the other day was somebody was looking in the nest and there was a different kind of egg in the nest. This was a Phoebe nest, but it could be any number of different birds that this might happen to. And this is probably a brown-headed cowbird egg. 
so cowbirds lay their eggs in other birds' nests, and they usually hatch a little sooner and grow faster. So what happens is the adult birds incubate the eggs, the young ones hatch, the cowbird chick is a little bigger, grows faster, it gets more food, and it has a tendency to either push out its foster siblings, or they get starved out because the cowbird chick gets all the food. So you have a Phoebe that ends up raising one or two cowbird chicks um, and none of its own. It is a natural process, um, but the cowbird population has increased as we've had more development going on. They can, they're much more common in urban areas than they are in deep forest areas. Uh, so something to, to watch for as you see a nesting bird. Now, what do you do if you've got a nesting bird in a hanging plant? Or the Christmas wreath that you forgot to take down from the door? Happens all the time. You, you've got your wreath out, it's great, and Christmas goes by and you just leave it up there. It looks nice and it's fine and it starts to turn brown or it's spring and you say, time to take that wreath down and you look and there's a nest. Or, oh, oh dear. Let's see, we're having trouble playing the video. I don't know if you can see me, folks. All right, if anybody can hear me, let me know. All right. Okay, I do not know if you can see me or hear me. It says I'm still live, but they're having trouble playing the video. Can anybody send me a comment and let me know if you can still see or hear me? Hmm. Doesn't look like it. All right. If you can still hear me, I am going to stop this video and I'll start a new one. I'll be right back. Hey folks, it's Becky again. This is taking a long time to get here. Can anybody hear me or see me? If you can, definitely leave me a message and send me any comments that you've got. Joe's here for moral support as we try and figure out how to make this all work. I was talking about birds, but that was half an hour ago, and that's how long it's taken me to get back online again. All right. Anybody have any questions? Is anybody still there? All right. I think, I think we're good. But maybe, Joe, you could go on Facebook and see if I'm there. Okay. So, hi, folks. Have I lost you entirely? Sorry about that. Definitely some challenges. I lost my video feed and then I couldn't get it back for the longest time. So I was talking a little bit about birds and hanging plants and I wanted to finish that up. Uh, this will be um, posted. Oh, I'm here. Yay, thank you, Terry. Um, this will be posted on New Hampshire Audubon's uh, YouTube channel. So uh, if you missed it live, then uh, you can look at it there. And I want to finish what I was mentioning about birds nesting in hanging plants or in wreaths on the door, because I didn't finish up that before I lost you all. So the, if you've got a bird that nests in 
hang, a hanging plant or in a wreath, it's likely to be a house finch. They most commonly do that. Um, robins sometimes nest in plants as well. So if you've got a nest in a plant, you can go ahead and water it, just water it a little bit at a time so it doesn't make the whole nest wet. You just put some water in on the opposite side from the nest and a little bit in. You might need to water more frequently, but that's okay. The birds will get used to um, a periodic disturbance. So pick a time every day when it's easy to water, give a little bit of water and just leave. The bird will be okay. Um, if it flies off when you water, it'll come right back. And if you've got a nest in a wreath and you really want to take that wreath down, well, hold on for just a little while. If it's something like a house finch, you've got about two weeks where the bird is incubating the eggs and then another two weeks before the young fledge and leave the nest. So just let it hang there until the young birds are gone and you can peek and check at it and see and you'll wake up one morning and find that there's nobody in the nest. And as soon as that happens, you can go ahead and take the wreath down uh, because the birds, the young birds will not come back to the nest at night. Once they leave, they're gone. So go ahead and take the nest down right away. Now you want to take it down as soon as you can because sometimes birds will use a nest again for a second brood. So if the bird has, um, has left, the young ones have left, take the net, the, that wreath down right away so the birds don't try to build another nest in the wreath again the same year, right after the young ones have left. Uh, and in your hanging plant, you know, just water a little bit and everything will be fine. That will work out very well. And that's it on our baby birds, or at least on our nesting birds. Some birds have already been nesting. Um, morning dove young ones are already uh, out of the nest. Um, they're, the young are flying in their first brood and they will try again. The parents will try again for another brood. Some birds are just coming back. They're just getting started. Um, some birds are, are uh, still setting up their territories. Others are building nests. Others are laying eggs. So it's an exciting time of year to have new birds coming back and all this breeding activity getting started. Great time to be here. There are a couple of other things I just wanted to make a note about when it comes to um, nests getting started. And that is that um, and there are times when birds put nests in places where you, they they don't want to be or you don't want them to be. So sometimes they could nest in something like a trailer and um, you need to move that trailer. And this actually happened to us at New Hampshire Audubon. We had a trailer with canoes in our parking area and a Phoebe nested in, actually, no, I'm sorry, it was a robin. It nested in one of the canoes on the trailer and we needed that trailer and the canoes for summer camp. Well, when it comes to moving nests, birds do, even if they watch you move the nest, they don't really recognize that that's what's happened. Birds return to the location where the nest was. So when the bird is there, it has certain features that it keys in on and it comes back there looking for the nest in that exact location. So the key to, to trying to move a nest, if you absolutely can't wait for them to finish nesting, and remember it could only be two to three weeks before they're gone. Um, if you can't wait for them to finish nesting, then you can try what we did, which is the first thing we did was get a cardboard box, shallow box, cut out one side of it so the birds didn't have to go up and in to get in it so that birds could fly right in. And we put the nest right on the, in that cardboard box and put the box right where the nest had been. So it was still in the exact same location, it was just in a box. And then what we would do is gradually move the nest, maybe six inches or a foot initially, just a little bit so that it was close enough the bird could still key in on 
the features and where that nest was. And then we put up a ladder and then the next day, the, la the ladder top was right next to where the nest was. We moved the nest onto the top of the ladder and then gradually adjusted it. And then eventually we were able to drive the trailer away and the nest was sitting there on top of the ladder. And it actually worked. The young ones had hatched, the adults continued feeding them, and then they fledged soon after that. So the ideal is to leave the, the nest there and um, let the, the process continue. Roughly two weeks incubation, roughly two weeks until the young ones fledge if it's a small songbird. If you can't do that, that principle of trying to get the nest onto something that like a box, that something is in that exact spot, and then you can gradually move it, but make sure that what you put the nest on has some sides, some landmarks, so that the bird recognizes the box now as an indication of where the nest is, rather than, in our case, the canoes. I've also done it with a bird that nested on the ground, a gull nest, and we did something very similar. We put the, the nest right on a board and left it in exactly the same place. We put, we covered that board with the rocks and all the vegetation that was right around the nest so that the adult gull could key in on that and then would find its nest. And then we gradually moved it six inches initially, a foot the next time, but very small distances so that it would still key in on the, the rough location and then the specific location was, was the nest itself and the things right around the nest. So that's something to try if you absolutely can't wait for the birds to fledge. But hopefully you can. And I thank you all for your patience. If anybody has any questions, you know, we will try and do this again. Um, we'll post it and I'll see if I can't uh, get the technology to work a little bit better next time around. Um, and really appreciate your support of New Hampshire Audubon. Um, we hope you'll consider making a donation to help us. And there's a way to donate right on our, our, on our um, webpage. Thank you so much. And I will be back again with another attempt at answering your questions. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.